Welcome to Everything Co-op, bringing you information on how cooperatives can help improve your quality of life. This show is being sponsored by the National Co-op Bank, NCB. The NCB is dedicated to strengthening communities nationwide for the delivery of banking and financial services for the nation's cooperatives, their members, and other socially responsible organizations. For more information on the power of community ownership, visit ncb.coop. That's ncb.coop. Now stay tuned for your host, Vernon Oaks. Good morning, everybody. This is Vernon Oaks. Welcome to Everything Cooperative. It's a wonderful day in the Washington, D.C. metropolitan area. We want to talk to you about the power of cooperatives. The National Cooperative Bank is sponsoring this program so that you can get the benefits of cooperatives. It could be a housing co-op. It could be a credit union. Any kind of worker cooperative, any kind of business you can think about could be a cooperative. And listen, I want to have a conversation with you this morning, and if you'd like to join into this conversation, you could call in at 1-800-450-7876. What we want to talk about is the spiritual aspect of cooperatives. You know, it came to me, my sister went to a power lunch yesterday with Reverend Matthew Watley at Reed Temple AME Church. It's a lunch, 20-minute conversation. He talked about good health. He talked about good health. And when she came back and talked to me about it, first, I was sorry I missed the the conversation about good health. He spent a lot of time talking about the social aspect of good health. And when my sister came in, by the way, she's sitting here in the studio with me this morning. Don't expect her to, to talk unless she really has something great that she wants to say to you. But it was like um, she could see how the social aspect of good health, how that is at the core of cooperative. Because in our business, uh, I'm in the process of working with the employees of Oaks Management to make it into a worker cooperative. And the aspect of co-ops that really first caught my attention was the aspect that when decisions are made, they're made jointly. They're made by the people who are in the co-op. And if that is a worker co-op that would be the employees of the organization own and control the business. And they are the ones that set up how the organization will run, how it will operate through its bylaws, through its rules and regulations, uh, employee manuals. When you look at all of the aspects of how a business runs in this boilerplate language of policies and procedures, then the employees are the ones that create those documents And what I liked about the worker cooperative is that the employees are the ones to make the decisions in an organization. They get to choose this way or that way. So how does this have to do with social good health? What I got from Brenda, at least what what I heard her say was Reverend Motley was talking about when when you're looking at good health and social health is really the people that you're involved with. Who are the people you involve? Who are the people that you choose to be in your life? You know, we don't have a choice of who our parents are going to be. We have no choice of who our siblings are going to be, our uncle, our great aunts. Uh, We have no choice in that, but we have a lot of choice on who we choose to have as our friends. Some cases we have choice, but not a lot of choice. If you have a job, you may not have a choice of who sits next to you or who works in your area or your division, your group. But in a worker co-op, the people in the co-op, they are the ones that decide who are the members of the co-op. They are the ones that decide how decisions will be made. They are decide if there's going to be a hierarchy organization or if it's going to be a group organization. In a hierarchy, you would have an executive director or a president, and you'd have committees and maybe vice presidents and on down. And it functions as a normal business, a shareholder business, uh, capitalistic sort of model where there is this hierarchy of who makes what decisions. But in a co-op, even if they choose to have a hierarchy, they choose how that hierarchy will function. One example, when we had equal exchange, which is a co-op that I really like and um, would have loved to work my career in that kind of an organization or in that particular organization, one rule that they decided is that 
when you come to compensation, that the most difference you can have is three times. And that is that if the president of organization can only make three times as much as the lowest paid person in the organization, whomever that is. And I really like that. I, I remember the first time, I think it was Iacocca at uh, Chrysler making millions and millions and millions of dollars with salary and bonuses and stock options and all of the different ways of getting compensation. And now, and we talked about this once, uh, once in the program of the billionaires, those people that make tremendous amount of money. And if you have a billion dollars and you've invested at 4%, you know, um, that was like $40 million you make a year without even working. So once you start making all of this money and these people in these high, in the organizations and these the fortune 500 companies that make all of these huge, huge, huge salaries, it's much more than what perhaps the janitor would make if that's the lowest paid person. But in this co-op and equal exchange, at least the janitor is going to make, if the janitor is the least paid person in equal exchange, one third of the amount of money that the highest paid person is paid. And so you get the employees making these decisions. So you have a much better chance of people feeling better about themselves. And what Reverend Motley, according to my sister Brenda, said was, uh, you really want to have people around you that are positive. You want to choose to have positive people around you, whether that is in, at your workplace or where you live or if it's where where you play, whether whatever it is, whatever organizations that you belong to, and your best friends. You really want to have people around you that are positive. Don't want negative people around. This is what he talked about at his power lunch yesterday. And the, sub, the topic was who has good social health. He says one of the pieces that came out of it was on this social health, which made her think about this co-op. I didn't think about it that way when I decided that I liked co-ops. But that really is what is at the core of the co-op, and we've talked about that several times on the program. Matter of fact, when Jim Joseph, who was the ambassador to South Africa, talked about Ubuntu, Ubuntu is a concept in Southern Africa, he said, where it is that I am because you are and you are because I am. And I get that's a spiritual concept and at the core of co-ops that we are all in this thing together. We're all working together, this togetherness, this cooperative, working together for the benefit of the group as opposed to working for just me. When I was talking about this concept, Reverend Smith at my church, Shiloh Baptist Church, had said that it's, uh, I think he said, I forgot who he said it, but it was a philosopher that said, I think, therefore I am. I think, therefore I am. So it's this concept of individualism. I am. I am because I am. That whole concept is seemingly what drives this capitalistic society and drives greed. Greed from a standpoint is I'm going to make decisions that gives me the best return on my investment. I don't care about anybody else. I don't care necessarily about the customer. I don't necessarily care about the employees. I am just concerned about what is best for me. And this return on investment, which was the main criteria when I went to the MBA program, was you made decisions that would give the stockholders the greatest return on investment. That was the main variable. Now, they did talk about good service and great products and all of that, but it was in the context of the best return on investment. What is best for the stockholder? What is best for the individual? And again, Jim Joseph talked about that in Southern Africa, that too often those in power were making decisions on this individualism kind of philosophy individualistic philosophy of I am because I am, I think therefore I am, I make decisions that are best for me as opposed to the social view, this Ubuntu, I am because you are, you are because I am, and they call it a humanistic kind of value system, humane, that we're working together. That's what's at the core of cooperatives. And a cooperative is any business you can think about. 
you think about a business on a spiritual standpoint of working for what is best for the group of people, and if that business is owned and controlled by the employees, then it's called a worker cooperative. If that business is owned and controlled by the customer, those that use the products or services, it's called a consumer co-op. And the customer of that business, the credit unions, are consumer co-ops. The credit unions are the ones, uh, the members in the credit unions decide and vote on who would be the board of directors. And then that board of directors are the ones that make policies and decisions that run the business of the credit union. Same thing for housing co-op. And in my day job, what I do is I manage cooperatives. I manage housing, uh, multifamily housing that could be an apartment building, a condo, or a co-op. And that's where I learned about co-ops. And I really literally fell in love and very passionate about this particular model because of this social good health that it that it that it brings about. Now I found out that everybody is not co-op material. Those people that really just are out for themselves, egocentric, uh, self-centered personalities. And I don't necessarily think that's the worst thing in the world. But those people just probably won't find it very nice and very healthy to be in a co-op. Those people that don't want to work, don't want to work, we're going back to, to John Smith and the pilgrims when they first came out, no work, no eat. That was I had that in class a long time ago, so if I got the wrong guy's name, I, I apologize about that. But it's like if you don't want to work, then there's no reason for you to be in a, in a co-op. So a definition of a co-op is it is uh, any kind of business you can think about. If it's owned and controlled by the employees, it's called a worker co-op. If it's owned and controlled by the customer, the people that use the products or services, it is called a consumer co-op. Housing co-ops, credit unions are are examples of consumer co-ops. Now, if it's the also there are some companies that can come together or people that come together that make their products and services, and they might want to buy their goods to make them and they buy them in groups. They get a larger volume. And perhaps they can get it at a lower price or a better quality. They are called producer co-ops, and if they come together to sell their products together, they're called marketing co-ops, and farmers use both of those examples. So in the Department of Agriculture, and we had a gentleman on the program from the Department of Agriculture, U.S. Department, they have a lot of knowledge about co-ops. Perhaps the, that organization, the U.S. government, has the largest because they've been working with farmers and co-ops for some time. But the spiritual aspect is what we want to talk about. And if you want to be on this conversation, please call in at 1-800-450-7876. We're going to take a break now. Please don't touch that dial and call in and let's talk. We'll be right back. News updates on the web at woldcnews.com. Welcome back, everybody. This is Vernon Oaks. We're talking about cooperatives today. This program is brought to you by the National Cooperative Bank. National Cooperative Bank's mission is to help cooperatives grow by supporting and being an advocate for America's cooperatives and their members, placing special emphasis on serving the needs of communities that are economically challenged, especially serving the needs of communities that are economically challenged. A lot of times, the uh, in America, those communities that are economically challenged are communities of color. In every metropolitan area or rural community, you will find people, whether they are Latin Americans or African Americans, doesn't make any difference, but they're people of color. And the National Cooperative Bank was created in the early 1980s to help cooperatives in areas that are economically challenged. So if you have an idea of forming a business, particularly if that business is to solve com some community need, normally co-ops are developed out of solving a community problem. So a group of people, three, four, five, come together. And we've had on the program 
week after week examples of whether it's a co-op uh, lady was on a program called Harriet May out of out of Texas, and she said that in the 30s, five people got together. They were men. I forgot how much they put in, like $10 each or something. They pulled in some money together, and they started this um, credit union that is now worth over a billion dollars in assets. But people coming together because nobody would, would loan them money. Uh, there was no banks in this, these rural communities that would loan them money, so there was a need. And so they created a financial institution to solve that need in the form of a credit union so people could come in and borrow money to do what they needed to do. And those are low-income communities, uh, income resource limited communities. So you get these communities, you get a community that has a problem. If three or four of you would get together, you can we can help you find the resources that you need, that's the technical resources and perhaps even the financial resources to help you to start your business. And what normally happens in a co-op and Dr. Jessica Nimrod was on the program and she's written a book uh, that's talking about the history of co-ops in the black community. And she was saying that they don't normally fail. We have a lot less failure in co-ops and because people come together and so you have different skill sets and they come together and they learn how to work together. So you learn how to work together so that there will be, there, when there are problems, then there will be problems. There will be disagreements. Whenever you get two people together, there's going to be disagreements. People are going to see things differently. Check out most marriages at two people and there are differences. But in, a, in the co-op world, you learn how to resolve those differences with communications and a process. And so that you can make decisions through a democratic vote, one member, one vote. And once those, the vote has passed, if you had five people, if you got three people to vote it one way, then that's the way it would go. And then you learn, the other two learn how, okay, I didn't get my boy, but let's go on. Let's work toward it because that's what the group wants. Once you learn how to do that, once people learn how to do that, there's less chance for failure. And also through this last 20, uh, 2008, the Great Recession, a lot of housing co-ops didn't go under, like at the same rate that single-family houses and condos went under. And the reason was that the people in the cooperatives did not go out and get the kinds of risky loans that the folks in the house, in the single-family and condo market did. They didn't go out and get those risky loans because there's people working as a group. And in a housing co-op, there is a member committee. And sometimes that member committee is the board. And when a housing co-op is working and functioning correctly and well as it is designed, the member committee will look at every application. They will meet with the applicant. They will go over the application. They will talk to the applicant about what a housing co-op is and what are the responsibilities of someone that lives in a housing co-op. And so if somebody comes in and they have one of these risky loans, the housing membership committee is going to turn that down. That doesn't look right. It doesn't look like you can afford to live here. And I've seen them turn people away when they don't have the kinds of things that they need to have in order to be a good co-op member. So you just did not have the kinds of down the, the defaults, the foreclosures in the cooperative world in 2008 that you had in the rest of the market, which caused this great recession, not quite a depression, although I did hear once that uh, a definition of recession and, and uh, depression, the difference was that a recession happens when your neighbor loses their job, and a depression shows up when you lose your job. So that's when you talk to it about right down to the nitty-gritty of in a household is when an individual in a household lose their job, that makes it that household, that family in very bad shape, particularly if there's only one person working, and there's depression in that household. But if a neighbor loses their job, then there's worry and concern, uh, but not the same thing as when you lose your own. So that's one difference. How many different people ended up losing their job in this great recession that we just have gone through because it started with, people making bad decisions and bankers creating uh, mortgages that were designed to fail.
because the interest rates were going to go up much faster than people's incomes went up. And so, therefore, they couldn't pay the mortgages, so they were designed to go into foreclosure. And when all of those hit at once, it was amazing the ripple effect in our whole economy, how it just took down, you know, people couldn't fly, people couldn't go out to eat. There was in this, any aspect of the of the economy went down because people lost their homes, lost their jobs, and it took a big dive. It just didn't happen in the co-op world. There were some co-ops that had trouble, and it was like in Detroit that it was hit very, very hard with the 2008 Great Recession, and so the whole economy went down, and so people lost their jobs, and those those particular co-ops suffered. I don't know if they went under or not, but they definitely had a hard time. There was some here in, in the district that had difficulty because you had numbers of people that had lost their jobs or lost their incomes, and so that means that they can't pay their co-op fee or their rents or whatever, and then things happen going to go down pretty bad. But the other place was in California, that some co-ops had difficulty in those two regions. But for the most part, throughout the U.S., co-ops survived. They did, and they strived. They did extremely well, whether the housing co-op, credit union, uh, worker cooperative. And, and we talked about uh, co-ops in Mondegran, Spain, where it's an area after World War II that was very depressed in Spain, and so people got together. There was one, I think he was, well, he was a religious leader. I'm not exactly sure which, whether whether he was Catholic or some other religious, but he got together and started getting people to see how co-ops work. And now there are over 100 different co-ops, and I don't remember how many people, 55,000 people, that, that's in this co-op, but what happened in the Great Recession, because they were hit, Europe was hit very hard also. It, it, we, we were getting to where we had one world economy when something happens over here in the U.S., it affects everybody else. When something happens in China, it affects everybody else. So we're getting to be one. So this European world, they started seeing difficulty too, and there was one company that even in this Mondragon, Spain world that went under, and the rest of the co-ops hired those employees. Uh, it's kind of amazing that they support each other. Then they also, people took, I think they said 20% uh, cuts in their salary so they didn't have to lay off people. So you get the group of people working together. Therefore, in this, in this social health, you have people working together for the good of the group, doing positive things. All right. Therefore, the group survives and strives. I, I, I can't see how it could get any better except for those people that really just want to look out for themselves. But the values of cooperatives are based on the values of self-help, people helping themselves, but with self-responsibility and democracy working together. It is a point of self-help, but not at the exclusion of somebody else. It is with working together democratically. Again, that democratically is one member, one vote, and learning how to work democratically, which we all don't know how to do that, and we've talked about that on the program too, equality, equity, and solidarity, the values. In the tradition of the founders of cooperatives, cooperative members believe in the ethical values of honesty, openness, 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 transparency, social responsibility, and caring for others, and caring for others. The social aspect of not only working for self, but also for others, and the environment, being social responsible for what is going on in the environment. The ethical values. And from what I know about Christianity, since I'm a Christian, these values are Christian values. What I know about Islam, these values are Islamic. Most most religions, I think you'll find these values as what prompts up these these ethical values. When we come back, we're going to talk about the principles of cooperatives and what makes that that which is the core and the skeleton of a cooperative, what really works. And if it's a modern day co-op, they will use these principles. But we have to take another break and talk about the weather and the traffic, and then we'll be back talking about the principles of co-ops and the spirituality of cooperatives. 
Please don't touch that dial. We'll be right back, and you can call in with your questions or comments. Fourteen fifty WOL. You know, WOL makes a very, very good partner for this program. They uh, have been great to work with. Their motto is uh, information is power. Information is power. But I had a gentleman on a program from Senegal, Papa Sin, last year that said, you know, you can give people information, you can give them education, give them knowledge, but if they don't put that knowledge to work, it is putting energy and enthusiasm to the information, to the knowledge that gives it power. So it's like you can get knowledge, but you've got to put that knowledge to work in order to get the power out of it. And the cooperative fifth principle is education, training, and information. So not only did I fall in love and get passionate about this business model that I was not taught in school anywhere in my 20 years of education, but it was this education is a part of it. And it, when they first started out, it was a, a sort of a the same kind of education you would get in a four-year. It may not be at the level, but it was the same broad-based education of a liberal education, liberal college of reading and writing and arithmetic. Um, and one of the one of the uh, persons in the Hall of Fame, which we may talk about next week, is we had the last the co-op Hall of Fame. The co-op Hall of Fame is the highest honor you can get in this co-op world. And CDF, Corporate Development Foundation, sponsors that every year. And I went there and one of the recipients said that one of the roles that co-ops play around the world is helping people to get educated. This is for people that don't know how to read or write. It is that they learn how to read or write. They learn how to run a business. They learn the financial statements and what these numbers mean so that they can improve the health of themselves and their family and their community. And so they have a reason for getting this knowledge and that people get that knowledge. They're like, click, bang, it worked. They get the knowledge and they put it to work. They get the knowledge, they put it to work. And that's what I love about this cooperative principle of education, training, and information to help people to get the knowledge they need. Now, NCB's customers are cooperatives. We, we, that's in their mission, to help cooperatives grow. They could be cooperatives such as grocery wholesale cooperatives, and food co-ops could be uh, owned by the workers and therefore uh, or the employees. It would be a worker co-op, or it could be owned by the, the, the people that buy and shop there. You have both of those models in the food cooperatives. So if the people that work there, work in the food co-op, own it, then it's called a consumer cooperative. And some food co-ops that I've visited have the, a, a way of keeping their costs down is that the worker, the employer, the customer will go in and volunteer and work. And that volunteerism means that they don't have to pay the salaries, which keeps the cost of the food down so that their members can can buy it at a, at a uh, lower price. Also, the more you buy in a in a cooperative, the more you use the services of the co-op, when and if there is a profit, if there's something left over, if there's more money brought in than spent in a cash flow, they have more money coming into the business than spent, then the owners decide what happens to that money. And so let's call it profit for right now. But that profit could be kept in the business to help it to grow, or it could be passed out to the members through dividends. And in a food co-op, if the persons that bought the most groceries, the most that spent the most, they get the bigger return, not based on how much money you've invested. And that's the return on investment model we talk about in the capitalistic model. More, the more stock you buy in the capitalistic model, the bigger the dividend you get. So the more money you have, the more money you will get. In the co- in the co-op model, the more you use the products or the services, the bigger the dividend is that you'll get back, particularly in this consumer co-op and its food co-op. So NCB customers can be uh, grocery cooperatives, purchasing co-ops, or housing co-ops. 
other customers share in the spirit of cooperation, driven by, driven by democratic organizing principles. They may be Alaskan or Native American enterprises. By their nature, they are member-run and member-owned. If you go back to Africa, and we've had a, a couple people on that talks about the history of this cooperative in the African-American experience that in Western Africa, and I've recently found out from Southern Africa, from Western Africa, they brought these, these cooperative principles with them. They may not have called them cooperative, but they, by their very nature in the, in the uh, tribes, that they, they were member-run and member-owned. And Papa Sin, who I talked to you about earlier, said more often than not, they were women control, not men control. Um, Jessica Nimrod said that in the African American experience, mostly the co-ops were run by women, and that's been my experience for the housing co-ops. And the housing co-ops that I've managed, that most of the board of directors are women. Every now and then, you will get a housing co-op where you have men on the board, uh, and it's even rare that it's the president or the treasurer that is a male that is running that co-op. So more often than not, it's, it is member-owned, member-controlled. More often than not, it's women-controlled. But other of the uh, customers of NCB are community health centers or charter schools. They're driven entirely by community needs. Again, co-ops are normally born out of a community need or solving a community problem. What they all have, all of all of NCB's customers have in common is a single fundamental principle that they have joined together cooperatively to meet personal, social, and our business needs. So NCB started their charter established by Congress is a significant commitment to community revitalization in those communities that are economically challenged resource limited communities and that's the employment of the uh, cooperative model in the development of business and affordable housing is critical for low income americans and it strengthens communities in both urban and rural rural areas so this co-op model is an answer for the african american community you know i never believed even as a child i never believed that white America was going to give us 40 acres and a mule, okay? I just didn't believe it. I mean, we were told that after slavery. At least that's what I read a little bit in our history books, or I, I think it was more we were, I was told it. It wasn't in my history books coming up in uh, junior high or high school. So I was told, if I just, why would somebody that's got mules and acres and would give it away? So if that was promised, it wasn't delivered on. Uh, as a matter of fact, those African-Americans that have had land, um, more often than not, white Americans try to take that land in different kinds of schemes and ways. They definitely wasn't giving it up. But in, even in going through the business school again, I did not see how our communities, the low-income communities, the limited resource communities, uh, would be able to benefit after, uh, with this capitalistic model. I called it systemic discrimination. In the system of capitalism, it automatically discriminates against people that don't have money. If you're going to go get a loan and start a business, the bankers, most bankers, this is not NCB, uh, NCB has to do this to some extent. They have to make sure that you're going to be able to pay back the loan. Or the bank will go under. If they make a lot of loans that fail, then they will just not exist either. So they have to make sure for their own survival that they are making loans to people that will be able to, that will be able to, that can have the ability to pay and then do pay their loans back. And but for most banks in the classes that I took about banking, they look to see if you already have collateral, if you already have money or real estate or stocks and bonds, so that if you don't pay back that loan, they can go reach in and take that collateral. Well, in resource-limited communities, my brothers and my sisters, most of us did not have that collateral. So we could not go get the loan to start the business, to buy whatever we needed in terms of products or 
capital things like buy a building or buy equipment. We couldn't go to a normal bank. I tried it at 19 or 20. A friend of mine, we were going to start a restaurant. Thank God we didn't start it because we didn't know anything about it. But we went in and tried try to get money to buy the equipment. And the first thing the person asked, well, okay, what's your collateral? What do you own so that if you do not make, pay back this loan, we will be able to go grab that that, that asset and pay back the loan. That's what most banks do. And NCB, by their charter, congressional charter, they have to go in and make loans in low-income communities. So what do they do? I have it. I, they have not told me this, but I have it that they will look at the individual. They will look at the group of people that are coming together and make a decision based on the person as opposed to based on the capital. Will this person, persons, will they have the, where they work together to get the knowledge if they don't already have it to run this business? Will they work together to solve whatever problems come up in the business? And there are a lot of problems that come up in a business so that they will be able to sell products, whatever that is, get the money in, and will they, after they get the money, will they pay the bill? That gets to values. That gets to whether somebody have the kinds of values that are in a cooperative, the values of honesty, openness, social responsibility, and caring for others. Do they have the values? And according to my sister, Brenda, she said that's what Reverend Watley talked about. Social health values. If you want to have good health, if you want to be in an organization that cares for each other, where there is, you have a say in what goes on, everything is not pushed down, it's pushed up from the people from the bottom up. The co ops is the way you're going. I, it was somebody that was on the program, and I've got to go back and find out this because I, I recall it a lot, is with the NCBA, the National Cooperative Business Association. They have a, a group. They were started with CLUSA was their name, and so now it's NCBA CLUSA. And the CLUSA goes out. It's an international uh, work that they go out and they work and they help co-ops. And a big part of their portfolio is farmers, farmers throughout the world. And he was telling me about the farmer that said when he went to visit the farm, he saw how green and lush the vegetables were that this cooperative farmer was was growing. And right across the road was another farmer, and it was lean. The fruit, the, the veggies and stuff just were not lush. They were more skinny, if you will. They weren't as green. And the this person asked the farmer, what's the difference in being in a co-op. And he could see the difference in the two farms, the farmer in the co-op and the farmer not. But the farmer said that the difference was that he had enough now, being in a co-op, he could make enough to feed his family for the year and have something left over. Before that, he wasn't making enough to survive. Subsistence, he did not have it. Being in a co-op, he learned about good seeds, and then we've talked about that several times. Learn how to process those seeds. Learn how to harvest the product, and by working together, they had more markets they could sell their products and get a better price. So that he ended up with making enough money so he could feed his family for the year and have something left over, and that's called wealth wealth creation. And this is what happens in a co-op, whether it's a housing co-op, a credit union a farming co-op, any kind of worker co-op, you end up making enough money and then one of the other principles of a cooperative is member economic participation. If there's profit, then you end up sharing that profit. Please call in at 1-800-450-7876 with your questions, comments, and we'll be right back with our last segment. Don't touch the dial. News 
news updates on the web at WOLDCnews.com. Information is power. That's what we've been talking about. And that's what makes WOL a great partner to share this information about cooperatives, how they work, the benefits of co-ops, both individually and businesses and communities. And that community could be the world community. You know, the International Cooperative Alliance, their president is Dame Pauline Green. She was on the program, and she said something that was very, very interesting to me, and it, it touched me. It said that she said that co-ops, co-ops around the world, help people to come out of poverty with dignity. And I put that with what Jim Joseph, who was the ambassador of South Africa, he said. He said that most American programs that are given out for the development of, of people or to help people to survive, whether that's food stamps or welfare or TANF, Section 8 housing, most of those programs help people to survive, and that's great. I mean, I, don't get me, I'm not complaining about it. But what they don't do, and this is what he said, they don't help people to get wealth. They don't help people to come out of poverty. And when Dame Pauline Green said what the co-ops around the world, her experience is that co-ops help people to come out of poverty with dignity. So not only does it help them come out of poverty by creating wealth, the social wealth, social health that we've been talking about, the spirituality of cooperatives, but also in a very realistic financial way. It helps people like that farmer we talked about before we took break that had enough money after becoming involved in co-ops and learning, this fifth principle, getting education, training, and information about how to run a co-op, how to work cooperatively together to both get better seed. If Now, they, I think they were organic, so it's not better fertilizer, but different way of composting and getting fertilization to the uh, plant and then working together to sell them. So they get a better price for the product. They get a better product and a better price for their, their products, having starting out with better seed. So in a, in a co-op, it helped him and his family come out of poverty. They own land. They had a farm. They had a business. They just wasn't making enough to even feed his family for the year. And it, I remember my mother talking about, my mom and dad talking about having more month than dollar. Okay? Having, having more of a year than food. <laughs> Same kind of concept. Co-op helped him to come out of poverty with dignity, through knowledge, through learning, through training. So this is what the, the co-op does. Dame Pauline Green said it, and I couple that with what Jim Joseph said. If we could get even American policymakers, and I, I've asked this question several times on the program when I've had people on, why isn't it, since the, the co-op model has so many benefits. Why is it that the American dollar, the taxpayer dollar, will give money in the housing world, which I know more about, HUD will give more money to create apartment buildings than they do with with co-ops. The only money I know of, some because in the Wisconsin area, the people up there, including the HUD people, know co-ops, and they will do everyday co-ops. But most of the co-op money that the government spend is with senior co-ops. And that's a program for in, in HUD called 202 program. But all of it goes to apartments. Who makes the money with apartments? It isn't the individuals that live there. They do not create the wealth. Who makes the money for apartment buildings are the people that put in the money. The people already have money. They put in the money. And I've had it. And I've talked about it on this program. So one lady told me I was sinister with this view that the that the wealthy people will put money into campaigns that they will elect the members that they want to elect. And then when those members get into the Senate or the Congress, then they will create programs that benefit the wealthy, the people that got them in. That makes perfect sense from a standpoint of if, if I was running for election and I got money from Alonzo, who is working here in the, in the studio, if he gave me money and if he came to me and said, look, I need this program to help me out, of course, I'm going to want to help him out. He helped me to get in. So in, from a logic standpoint, that makes all the sense in the world. But it doesn't help people come out of poverty. Those people that are already in poverty, those people that, 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 are, that are struggling every day, that have more months than money, that have more year that they can't feed their family, the, the programs don't help them. These building apartment buildings 
don't help them to create wealth. It doesn't help them to get knowledge to run a business. And Carolina, good good morning to you. What what's your question or comment? Oh yeah, my comment is just to say um, the program is amazing. Thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, it's the first time I listen to the program. Uh, my friend um, Darren is always talking, and then we are talking how to improve our communities and working in to better stuff. So, okay, I'm Latina. African descendant, but Latina from uh-huh. Colombia. Then that's what my husband. Okay. Well, and, I, I am having a little trouble, Carolina. You're, you're African descent, my... Latina, and you're female. So you hit all three categories. You Latin. Okay. I'm African, so I got everything. Okay. So how do you want to help your community? Okay. We got um, the project to work in farms. It's um, Darwin, actually, he started already. And I'm working with people talking in here to start over, you know, growing up of our own food. Caroline, I am having difficulty understanding. So you're working with people to help them do? Farm. Farm? Farm. Okay. Like to start with, you know, grow food, no chemistry, natural, organic. So, yeah, so just want to say the program is amazing and that's what we should be doing. What part of the world are you doing this farming? Where are you? Farming? Where where do you do the farming? What state? Okay, now we are um, supporting people he's making already. So we start buying to all people, you know? In Jamaica? No, Dallas. Dallas? Yes. Okay. The reason I was asking you, Carolina, because there's a group called the Southern Federation of uh, Cooperatives, Southern Federation of Cooperatives, but I don't think they're in Texas. They go down in Louisiana... Alabama, Mississippi, North Carolina, and those, there's about nine states. But yeah. I... The thing we got now, we are starting, um, okay, we are in the concept to go up, uh, to work, improve, to make that. Do I make understand? <laughs> no, I don't, I don't quite understand you, and I really, I do want to understand. So can I, can, can I suggest okay, let's this? Let's make a resume, because it's kind of difficult for me. Sorry. But well, can... uh, I'm going to think about um the idea to farm some work in our own business is just amazing. And then uh, thanks for the program. And it's the first time I listen to the program, actually. Caroline, so, here's, here's what I would like for you to do, if you would. Would you give uh, Alonzo your number so I can call you back? Yeah, sure. And, and then so we can talk more to see how, because this farming part works extremely well with, National Cooperative Business Association and with the Federation of Southern Cooperatives. We had a guy on last week from Growmark that's in farming. So this, this you're in the world of farming where co-ops have been, and I think you could learn a lot if, if we could get you hooked up with the right people so that you can get the information and maybe the financial needs of how you can help. And the other thing about co-ops, when I've gone to uh, workshops and conferences, that people in co-ops share information willingly, easily. They don't hold back anything. They want people to to grow Amazing. and prosper. So I would love to get you n- into these networks yes. so you can and learn I from them. To get you my, my number. Okay, he's going to take it offline. And thank you so very much for calling in, and we'll be thank touching you. back to you. Sorry. Have okay. a good Bye. Hasta luego, senora. Thank you, Carolina, for calling in. And if anybody else out there would like to call in to talk about co-ops, that's an excellent idea to talk about farming, particularly natural and organic uh, farming and different kinds of things. Uh, there was another guy on from Clusa who was talking about how they kept, uh, in, in Latin America, how they kept the animals away. And this is the strangest thing. They would take ladies' pantyhose, and they would go to barber shops and get the hair from the floors, put them in the pantyhose, and hang them up over the crops, and that would keep the animals away. And and he and he said to me later on after he said that his his coworkers teased him and teased him about this, but it's all kinds of knowledge of how you can grow, particularly organic, that you cannot use the fertilizers and other things and pesticides to keep the the pest away. And these insecticides and stuff, they get on the plants and stuff, and they get into our bodies, and they cause diseases. And I really don't know, but might be one of the reasons that there's so much cancer going on that wasn't going on when I was growing up. But th- th- you learn little tricks of the trade of how you can get natural, organic foods and how you can grow these foods 
through working with individuals again, the sharing of knowledge is the is the number is the fifth principle, but the first and the biggest for me. Volunteer and open membership. It doesn't make any difference if you're Latina, African American, whatever your background is. You can be a member of a co-op. Democratic member control. We've talked about the third principle: members' economic participation. Normally, you put in some money, but you also get to share in the benefits and the profits. Autonomy and independence. You have to have ownership and control. That's number four. Number five is education. Number six is cooperation among cooperatives, and more and more of that's happening. And number seven is concern for the community. That social responsibility is a part of the DNA of a cooperative. You know, that's up the spirituality of co-ops. Uh, it, it's in there. It's just in the values and the principles of co-ops. We're glad that you join in. We thank Carolina for her question. We'll reach back to her. Uh, we'll be back next week uh, talking about cooperatives. And I'll be in a conference on rural America, and I'll try to figure out how I can call in and be in this program at the same time. In the meanwhile, have a great, great, great week and learn how to work cooperatively. Thanks a lot. 1450 WOL.